to talk a little bit about the conflicts and the compromises that we're going to have to make because of the uh, Fourier series, the Fourier transform. And I summarize that with my uh, couple rules I have here. Uh, there ain't no free lunch. <laughs> Rule one always applies. So no matter, uh, you might think that you want some particular thing, but uh, it's going to cost you one way or another. So the first thing we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about uh, something that's been around for a long time, and that's audio uh, amplitude modulation, or AM. Uh, and that's used on radio, uh, the AM radio, which used to be, when I grew up, that was all cars had on them. And FM was fairly new. Uh, and there's a joke about that. Uh, FM stands for something magic, and AM stands for also magic. I'll let you figure out what the F word was there. But anyway, um, we're going to talk about AM modulation. It's the easier of the two to understand. And it's going to uh, show exactly some of the conflicts that we have to deal with when we're talking about Fourier transform and how it, how it works. So we're going to have to deal a little bit with AM modulation. What I'm going to do is bring up a spreadsheet here. <clears throat> and on this spreadsheet, you will see that I have a waveform drawn here. Actually, a couple of waveforms on this graph. And let's see if we can put that, make sure that it's going to display on YouTube. Okay, and on this graph, uh, you see that there is a line that I've drawn in red, which is the wave that we're going to use to modulate the uh, carrier wave. And the carrier wave is called, is the blue line. The carrier wave is this continuous sine wave, and it is at the frequency that you tune to on the dial. So let's say you tune to 700, mega, 700 kilohertz, which is one of the uh, radio stations that's out there on AM band, WWL, if I remember right. It's out of New Orleans. And it does talk radio at night. And uh, you tune to that frequency, then it's going to be modified by the audio wave that's going out uh, from the guy doing the talking or the music or whatever. Now we're only showing one sine wave because it's a lot easier to understand. So if they had a test tone on there, that would be basically the sine wave. Usually it's 400, 400 hertz uh, test tone that they test with. But uh, most music, the human voice, everything else includes a whole bunch of different sine waves, but we don't want to complicate our life right now. We want to understand something simple. Okay, back in the old days, in the 70s, uh, CB radio was very popular. It got replaced by cell phones, I think, now. And there was a lot of uh, CB radio being used on uh, truckers to try to beat speed traps, and it became kind of a, it was like a folk hero kind of deal right there. So you had a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, movies and stuff like Smokey and the Bandit, and they were all talking on their two-way radio. Well, on the two-way radio, it was operated by AM modulation. CB radio did. And the way it works when you do AM modulation, you offset the sine wave, the uh, audio wave, by the peak value of the carrier wave. And then you multiply those two together. And when you multiply the two together, you end up with a waveform. It looks like this one here was like this hourglass kind of symbol. And uh, that basically is how much you're modulating the wave. Okay, the interesting thing about this is that you could form this waveform two ways. And it actually does two different things. If you look at it in the frequency spectrum, you have the carrier frequency, but you have these two things called sidebands, one of which is the carrier minus the uh, 
modulation frequency and the carrier plus the modulation frequency. And that, by doing so, it makes a bandwidth. Okay, now why do you need a bandwidth? Okay, if you tune your radio, your, a, your radio, and I'm sure you have one, and you put it on the AM band, and you go to uh, some frequency where there is no station, you will hear this loud hissing sound, a lot of noise. Possibly if there's lightning in the area, you hear some crashes when the uh, lightning strikes. And all of that's called static. That's just the term that people use, static. So to reduce the static, you want to uh, only listen to just the part of the frequency band that you're wanting to listen to. So they narrow the band. And then that allowed also more stations to be put on the, uh, on the, the radio band. So the rule back then was that they put those stations as close as they could be uh, to each other was 10 megahertz. I'm sorry, 10, 10, yeah, 10 kilohertz. And at 10 kilohertz, that meant that that side bands could only be plus 5 and minus 5 kilohertz from each other. So there was a uh, 5 kilohertz frequency limit for the modulating wave, which is why AM was not very high fidelity. It was really low fidelity. And uh, by doing that, it caused the, uh, well, it basically limited the amount of noise that you would listen to because you were only listening to a band of frequencies that was 10 kilohertz wide. Okay, by having that narrow bandwidth, that's really good, and it allowed more stations to be on the same band, um, although there still was some leakage between one station and another, because the tuners were not all that tight, the radios were not, and it also limited the power that the transmitter could put out. <coughs> it didn't have to put out a whole lot of uh, frequencies at one time because it was only going to do a bandwidth that was 10 kilohertz wide. Okay, to show you this way right here, what I did, I created this waveform by doing exactly the math that I told you I did up there. I took the carrier, offset it by, I'm sorry, I took the modulated wave, offset it by a DC value equal to uh, the peak of the carrier, which was 1. And then I multiplied the two together. And you can look at the math on this spreadsheet here. There's the carrier wave, the modulated wave. And then that's basically is the modulated wave times the carrier wave. And then that's how I created that waveform that I show there. Because to talk about the sidebands, you can do it two ways. You can do it with uh, doing some stuff called trig identities. I don't want to go there. I wanted to see it actually done. So what I did was I took the carrier wave. I took a lower frequency, which was the carrier wave minus the modulation frequency, which in this case, the, modulate, the carrier wave was at 25 kilohertz. The modulation frequency was at 2 kilohertz. I took the difference, that made 23 kilohertz, and I took the sum, and that made 27 kilohertz. I took all of those waves and then I added them together and you see this right in here is basically an addition. When I go to column E, I just summed all those together. You also have to do a divide by two. And I will give you a reference of where I got these formulas. Uh, but anyhow, the reference will be on my waves on my website which will be put in the uh, video notes. Anyhow, if you add those together, you end up with the same waveform that we had when we had that hourglass waveform. The frequencies are a little different. I had to make this work for uh, to make this plot, but uh, it, it, it works out. So now let's go back to that. Now we're going to get back into how it, what it has to do with Fourier transform. 
Okay, you see this amplitude of this carrier wave? I got it adjusted at 0.75 of the value of the uh, carrier wave. That would be 75% modulation. Back in the CB days, people used to uh, want to have the maximum signal. Now I got it at 0.1 and if you look at our waveform down here you see it just barely changes. Okay, People would want to try to uh, get as much signal out there to punch through the noise as they could. So a lot of guys would buy a microphone that had an amplifier built in it, and they would want to crank it up. So if we get to 100% modulation right now, which is the best you can get, but we'll see what happens when you try to get better. You see that that waveform cuts, goes all the way down there, and it just barely tips the, the top of it, barely tips so it cuts off the, uh, the signal. What happens if we try to go higher? So we'll go at a 150%. So we get to 150. Uh, it's actually, it's causing this waveform, the carrier wave, to change phase and, and go the opposite phase right there. But it's basically, we've cut, we're cutting off the waveform here. And actually the carrier wave probably would cut off it too because it probably can't really do that much. In other words, we're right back to what we did with the amplifiers with the guitar when we were talking about doing overdrive. What would that do? That would end up creating harmonics. And now all of a sudden we're taking up a whole lot more than that 10 kilohertz bandwidth. We are taking... If we could be taking up 20 kilohertz, 50 kilohertz. We could be taking up a whole bunch. And they called this splatter. And people that would over-modulate would just tick off everybody else because they were all over the whole band. And uh, so that's one of the things that Fourier Transform has to do because we end up with, we've cut the waveform, we've chopped the top off of it. And by doing the chopping the top, we are creating harmonics and we are causing many more frequencies to have to be modulated other than just our one frequency. So we've created ourselves a problem. And uh, that's exactly what happened. You'd have these guys and they would splatter all over the band. And other guys would get mad and hooping and hollering and all kinds of yeehaw stuff. Okay, well let's go to something a little more simple. Let's go to the old, old binary waveform digital called Morse code. <laughs> it was back what was first happening. Now in the case of Morse code, you're turning the carrier off and on. So as you turn the carrier off and on, you've got 100% modulation because it's either full on or full off. The problem is that if you turn it off and on very fast, even though you're only maybe type in 10 words a minute, which is something like 25 cycles per second. That would be, uh, I forget what 25 comes out to be, but there's 25 dots in a uh, five-letter word, and you're turning it off and on 25 times. And if you're going uh, 10 of those five-letter words, you take 10 times 25 and you'll come up with how often it's going off and on uh, but anyhow it's going off and on for relatively slow time slow frequency but the fact that you're causing a a square wave going into it uh, you've got a very fast change there so now all of a sudden you've got a really large bandwidth even though you're sending a really slow signal you have a really large bandwidth and they call those key clicks and uh, ham operators do not like it for exactly the same reason that the CB operators didn't like uh, people that were over modulating because it caused uh, it caused it to bleed all over the whole band. So they purposely slow that square wave down so that it has a slope on the front and a slope on the back, and it's actually a sinusoidal slope. 
and they end up with a ideal Morse code signal only takes a bandwidth of 200 Hertz 200 Hertz is really tight so there's no it reduces all that static and stuff that's on the way on the uh, shortwave radio when they're talking in Morse code so they have a relatively quiet signal that they're listening to there so there's another case of what it how Fourier transform we'll do one final case and this one we're going to actually go into uh, modern day maybe what did I do with it there we go and what we're looking at is a data sheet for a microprocessor. This happens to be the microprocessor that's used in the Adreno. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. And you see that we've got a clock up here that's going off and on, off and on, off and on. I guess in this case on and off, on and off, on and off. And just that's all it does. A lot of these timing diagrams, they do these as square waves. It looks like this particular one, they actually show a little bit of slope. As you're trying to make that really, really fast, it's going to require lots of energy and lots of bandwidth. And you've got capacitances and inductances, even in the chip, on the conductors that are within the chip. But you also have them on your uh, PC board that's connecting to this chip. And... Uh, those capacitances and inductances are going to require energy to dis be dissipated to get it to change from one state to the other. So there has to be a certain amount of time in here for each one of these signals. And as they go faster and faster speeds, they're having to go faster and faster energy. And they have to go higher and higher bandwidth. So the Fourier transform is used in all of this stuff. Uh, it's the concept, and from what I understand, when they talk about these square waves, they try to get at least the 13th harmonic, even with these non-square square waves. So that means that all the electronics has to be handle, able to handle the 13th harmonic. Let's say that this thing is cycling at 1 megahertz. So actually... The electronics has to be able to handle 13 megahertz. So, Fourier transforms used for everything. Now let's go back to our little summary pictures. And where did I put them? Looks like I closed the sheet. Anyhow, we go to our summary back here. There ain't no free lunch, and rule one always applies. And that's always true. When we go to the other ones that I wrote here for that, a change over an infinitesimal small time, fast rise or, or fall time, requires very high frequencies, even if that change happens rarely. And that was with a case that we talked about with Morse code, where the code actually... Uh, is relatively slow, but if we have a fast rise and fall time, we're consuming a whole lot of bandwidth, and our transmitter is having to spread that signal around, so it's not being very efficient, and it's definitely not efficient at the receive end. And then the last one, A change over an infinitesimal small time requires an infinite bandwidth and infinite energy. And that's what was happening in the chips, in the uh, digital chips. They have to pump that signal in and out really fast. And as they do, it requires a lot of energy. That requires a lot of heat that's built up in the uh, chips. And that's why if you look inside your computer, you'll see a big heat sink on top of your uh, CPU and you also see a fan that's blowing on that heat sink and that's to keep that uh, chip cool because they're having to use a lot of energy even though it's a small chip they have to use a lot of energy there to discharge capacitors and to push signals through inductors. Okay in the next 
uh, video is probably end up just being a post because this one's going to be too complicated to make a video out of. Um, I'm going to talk about some really amazing magic that they did back when they did televisions and they went from black and white to color. Uh, they made a major use of Fourier transform. Anyhow, hopefully you got something out of this. This was a little bit hard to describe, a little bit disjointed. If you go to my website, and I'll have the link in the video, I will have a reference to a uh, really good article about the Morse code. I also have a reference. Uh, you will be able to uh, download my spreadsheet if you want it. And uh, I think I have one other reference there. So there's a, uh, oh yeah, I have the reference to the Wikipedia article that describes the formulas that are used to describe a, a AM audio, I'm sorry, amplitude modulated waveform. So there's a lot of stuff there if you want it. Appreciate you listening. Hopefully you got something out of this. This is Gary Fox of Great Night.